Ashley Ransom. Friends, may I welcome you all very warmly to this evening's program on behalf of Manthan. Three days from now, Manthan will celebrate its sixth birthday. So Manthan has been in existence for three years. Not just that, about I think 25 meetings from now, we would uh, mark the century meeting. So. Um, we started with something like one meeting a month and now the demand is two meetings a month and we still have a big audience. Well, may I, on behalf of all of you here and Manthan, warmly welcome Mr. Arun Shauri in our midst. This event is jointly being organized with Harper Collins. Uh, Mr. Shori is of course somebody who is not know, new to any of you. Mr. Shori is a very, very well-known journalist. He has been a minister. He is one of those uh, very few fearless, outspoken men of this country and of course a public intellectual. Uh, I'm not going to attempt to say uh, a lot more about Mr. Shori because I know what I will leave out will be just as important of, as what I would be saying. So I just introduce him with these few words. And uh, I very fervently hope, like many of you in the audience, that it wouldn't start raining today. I know Ajay has been one of the most uh, stressed persons the whole day today, hoping, in, I wouldn't say praying because he rarely does that, uh, hoping that it doesn't rain. And being a non-believer, he, he doesn't uh, share a good relation with upstairs. So, he has been texting all his friends to use their good offices with the rain gods. So, let's hope it won't rain and if it does, please be patient. We move into one of the halls and I know that all of you are waiting to hear Mr. Shaw. So, with these words, over to Mr. Shaw. and taken the first step and that is that he has at last also named the Prime Minister and Finance Minister as to how they were all in the know and my request to him would be to now take the second step and tell us who got the full money also. <laughs> but today the subject is very different and uh, Mr. Gandhi had directed that I should speak about the substance of the book and then, of course, I would love to be here uh, to answer any questions that you feel I should. And I'm very delighted that many old friends, and they raise here, we knew each other 45 years ago in Syracuse when we were studying, in, uh, doing our doctorates. And Desh's mother is here, that, um, mothers of special children to whom this book is dedicated. Uh, so I uh, the book actually, and I'm very grateful to Harper Collins also. Uh, it, I used to publish my own books, 
And this is after a long, long period that I thought I should go back to such a distinguished publisher as uh, Harper Collins uh, in this regard. So the book, uh, the news bank, so to say, about the book is what I have done by serving of a child who is a spastic child uh, for 35 years. And what I have learned by serving my wife who is uh, who's had Parkinson's now for almost 22 years. So naturally these are, uh, these uh, ex such experiences stretch you to the limit and therefore there are many lessons to be learned and the book is a bit around there and in Delhi uh, we had a fine function in which instead of asking these ministers to release the book I had requested and I, that we had our, the hero of the book, our son, uh, release the book by giving the first copy to the heroine of the book, which is his mother. Um, and, uh, the, um, in a sense, uh, actually not in a sense, but we are, uh, all Indians are a deeply religious people. But uh, unfortunately, we don't think about even the religious practices that we uh, do, or the religion, or the, uh, uh, or the phrases, or notions of religion that we keep repeating. So, in a sense. And we go through the motions mechanically, sometimes with faith, sometimes with the mind elsewhere. Um, we repeat some of the phrases, but we don't think about them, we don't think through the concepts which we just keep repeating. And uh, in many cases, as I have shown in the book, uh, for persons who are actually suffering, those, um, those, uh, Notions are a taunt, are a scoffing, are a denial of the reality of the person's suffering. So, in a sense, my book is a plea that we should think through and think again about these customs, uh, about these phrases. And similarly, about rituals and about customs. My plea is that we should, um, we should, uh, you know, in a sense, they are independent of any transcendental reality that they, that they, that we may be trying to evoke through them. They are, in a sense, the experiment heritage of a society of persons of great insight who saw the therapeutic value of those rituals, let us say. But in India, as the Americans outsource back office operations to Bangalore, we outsource these rituals to somebody else. Shrat Hora, in memory of our ancestors, and we outsource it to some poor priest. <laughs> Similarly, in the case of marriages, so many of us go through them without really knowing what is being recited. And what are the things we are um, binding ourselves to? So, to immerse ourselves fully in those, uh, uh, even if you want to call them just rituals, so that at least the therapeutic value can be imbibed and the traditions kept alive in a real sense of the term, not just mechanically gone through. But my main plea in that is that we must be open to new knowledge. You see, this has been the strength of all Indic traditions. Unlike traditions, the Semitic, the Abrahamic traditions, for a long time, and even till today, some of them have shut themselves to new knowledge. 
Because everything that was great and good, everything that was worth knowing is already in one book revealed by one person. But in our case, that was never the you know, position. We were open to new knowledge. And throughout, the great reformers were always reformulating the received concepts and they received notions. Even till Gandhiji's time. And many of them personified a different form, like Sri Ramakrishna Parvati. As you know, at that time, in late 19th century, idolatry had been made uh, uh, almost a dirty word. Uh, 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 what do you call it? Uh, a mark of inferiority because of um, Christian propaganda, for instance, because of um, or things that were regarded as reformist movements like Brahmo Samaj. But Ramakrishna Paramahansa, in his simplicity and, he, and, the, uh, and his magnetic, captivating personality made idolatry respectable. And the very person in whom Max Müller and others had reposed so much hope that he will Christianize India, uh, in that case, uh, the head of Brahma Samaj, uh, he himself became a devotee of Ramakrishna Parishad. In the same way, right up to I mean, Raman Maharishi personifies quite a different thing. But he re-establishes the great might of the Vedantic tradition, of the Advaitic tradition. But if you see the formulations, they are completely new. In Gandhiji's own case, as you know, he derived non-violence, non-violent satyagraha from the Gita. And the orthodox of Puna said, where do you get this from? But the Gita is set in the midst of a war. And Arjuna doesn't say, I will now go on a fast, not even like a fast until death between lunch and, dinner, lunch and breakfast. <laughs> He says, I will fight, I will kill and be killed. So where do you get this non-violence from? So Gandhiji's famous answer is, from here. That what I have written in the Anashakti Yoga, which is his uh, commentary on the Gita, is born out of an unremitting experience of 30 years to live the Gita in my life. So what happened was, that was the strength and that is why Hinduism and Buddhism and all could not be destroyed. Because it, they were constantly adapted to changing times, they were open to new knowledge. And these reformers were ones, I have compared them to algebraists who leave the expression within the bracket unchanged and just change the sign outside. The expression acquires a completely new meaning. Sacrifice, prayer, ego, all these were reformulated according to the needs of the times and according to bringing them in harmony with the advances of knowledge. Now, here, this plea is taken, is illustrated by taking up a question which is, which affects all of us, and that is, what is the explanation for suffering? Because who is it who has not suffered a blow? And what, is the, what are the explanations in the basic religious texts, the Old and New Testament, the uh, Quran, our Upanishads, Gita and Brahma Sutras, that is one part. Second is, what is the explanation which was given by our great saints, and I have taken two great examples of the last 150 years, the two great examples, 
as, the, as illustrating that, and that is Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa and Sri Ramat Maharishi. What did they say when persons who were who had been dealt a blow went to them for service? And what did they say when they, the blow eventually hit them? Because as you know, both in the case of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa and Sri Raman Maharishi, they died extremely painful and protracted deaths because of cancer. And you can imagine what cancer a hundred years ago was, how painful it must have been and in Ramakrishna Paramahansa's case, and about 50-60 years in the case of uh, Raman Maharishi. Ramakrishna Paramahansa got cancer of the throat. To the, he could not swallow even water in the end. In the case of Ram, uh, Raman Maharishi, a, uh, a tumor appeared and the devotees at that time, contemporary accounts first describe it as an orange. That it had become as big as an orange. It was cut off. It immediately sprouted a little two inches above and became, the devotees right at that time, a cauliflower with pieces falling off every day and on constant oozing of pus and blood. Another operation was done and it immediately sprouted again and became the size of a coconut. Till the doctor said there is no remedy except to amputate the arm and Raman Maharishi said, no, I am telling you there is no remedy. So nothing will be done and he passed away. So, but what did the, he say? What did Ramakrishna Paraman say? Why has this affliction come to him? And what did the devotees say? Swami Vivekananda, an absolutely strong and skeptical mind. What did he say about Ramakrishna Paraman? Because for them, it was the incarnation of God. So, why did this thing happen to the God? So, the book is about that. And similarly, the, the, the knots into which um, a firm believer ties himself, if when he believes and says that not a leaf moves but by his will, and not a leaf moves but to subserve his purpose. Is, uh, please remember, in this, throughout this book, I have very consciously always used he to describe God. And Rinal Pante said, um, Anita, that is my wife, Anita, you should remember, he has never said she. But that is absolutely true, because the, because the deeds which are attributed to God in these books are so terrible that I would never attribute them to a lady. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Mark Twain said that it is best for his reputation that he doesn't exist. <laughs> now, this is illustrated by Gandhiji. Firm believer. Gandhiji is uh, campaigning in the south against untouchability. And he hears about this great earthquake in Bihar. At that time, it was a very big earthquake. Mr. Bhargav would remind us, 30,000 people were said to have been killed within a few minutes. And Gandhiji says in the evening meeting that day, I begin the account from there in that particular chapter that this is God's punishment for the, for to us for practicing the sin of untouching. And he goes on saying this. This obstinacy is necessary if you want to do great things. But it has consequences also. So eventually, one month later, he is in India. In the meantime, Rabindranath Tagore has issued a public statement chastising him for spreading the superstition. So Gandhiji says, yes, it is, maybe it is a superstition, but the fact of the matter is that I share this superstition with the whole of humanity. It doesn't make it reasonable. Then, a science student asks him, Sir, there is more untouchability in the South. 
So why did the earthquake not take place there and here? And if, as you know, 18 months later, there was an even bigger earthquake in which flattened Quetta. No untouchability there. So then Gandhiji is to, uh, has to modify his position. He said, okay, okay, don't believe that it is against the sin of untouchability. You imagine it to be a punishment for any sin that you think should be eradicated and thereby you will be encouraged to eradicate and get rid of your own sin that way. Good point. But it is an instrumental use. But the point is that if not a leaf moves but by his will, then actually all this is happening only because of his will. Natural disasters are like that. But then the same thing happened in the case of the, of, let us say, of man-made disasters like Hitler's persecution of the Jews. So the Jewish philosophers ask him, the great philosophers of the time, we, we have been following you since 1908. They write to him. We are always trying to see what in your teaching should we use for our plight. But now what do you say, what is your counsel to us? And why is this happening to us in Germany? So there is a long, it's a long exchange and it is, um, uh, Gandhi does not come out well in that, as you can see. And these chapters of Ramakrishna Paramahansa, Ramana Maharishi and Gandhi were very difficult for me to write because I, like all of us, revere the three of them. It's not difficult to write about my wife and child, I know them. I wrote it in two days. And everybody who reads it says we were moved to tears by those. But that is very easy to write. It's writing about these persons whom we are aware that it was so difficult to um, go through. Gandhiji says, no, no, because you see, they say we have been non violent, the Jews. He said, yes, yes. But there is not enough non violence in your heart. <laughs> Baba, we are going to the gas chambers non violently. He says, yes, but not with love for Hitler in your hearts. <laughs> not with a smile on your face. These are incredible statements. But when you believe that nothing could have happened but by his will, then the Jews were being sent by his will. And he had given Hitler free will so that he could exterminate. And they will get Israel. So this uh, difficulty of, uh, is also illustrated. In the second, uh, you see, we, I give you some instances of how we don't think through these matters. You just take the question of God itself. Of course, we say Nirmun God. But the fact of the matter is, uh, we say it is just mere Shakti, mere energy. But then we actually, we actually put attributes. We don't, we say Akal Purush, we say Nirgun, we talk of mere energy and say, see, quantum physics is justifying that. But actually we are attributing uh, attributes, we are attributing motives, we are attributing preferences. If I don't go to the temple on Tuesday, if I don't do namaz five times, if I don't go to the church on Sunday, is that, but why should he be pleased or not pleased? How can a force, a mere force? So these things are not taught. Now I give you, if we say he is all powerful, all knowing, compassionate, and intervenes actively in human affairs, he punishes us for untouchability. Yada yada hi dharmasya, whenever a religion, unrighteousness rises and righteousness has to be, I come down, Krishna and Gita. Now, if the child is born blind, of course the Quran says that I am the one who has put the nature in the womb itself, what he will be. But even if you disregard that claim of Allah, if he is all powerful, all knowing, and compassionate, and intervenes, why has the child been born blind? 
either he is not knowing or he knows and does not have the power or he knows and has the power but is not sufficiently compassionate or doesn't care quite simple even the simple, even individually these notions cannot uh, withstand uh, examination i'll tell you all powerful every uh, philosophy course has these three all powerful let us say can god take a pillar and guard it in the earth so that it becomes immovable nobody can move it including himself if he cannot make the pillar immovable then he is not all powerful if having put the pillar he cannot move it he is not powerful is he all knowing then he must know the future then of course when he gave free will to hitler he should have known he would have known that this is how hitler will misuse it or pol pot or mao or stalin or anybody but other than that just think of it logically is he all knowing then he knows the future then can he make the future completely random that is completely unpredictable if he can't then he is not all powerful if he can make it completely unpredictable then he is no longer all knowing because he doesn't know what will happen so much but we keep repeating all these phrases and not repeating them becomes a, uh, a mark of impiety rather than of actually of having thought the matter through the same thing for explanations if you see the big first explanation always in every book is he is testing our faith in him he puts us through this suffering to test our faith in him now having created this infinite number of universes because this is not the only universe having created the infinite number of galaxies in this one universe having created the infinite number of stars in this one galaxy why is he so obsessed with this speck of a man on this speck of an earth in this one of infinite number of galaxies in this one of an infinite number of universes reverse him or not kyo if a father did that we would say he is an ego maniac he beats his child because the child does not rever him are why but we don't think that we say he is testing our faith similarly we say no no yes he puts uh, he is building our character through suffering i give you uh, an instance is put uh, recounted there see baba amte came to delhi and he told me are are run mujhe wahan le chalo apne jahan tumhari wife ko school ki ab the my wife had helped set up a school she was working there for specific children she said maine wo school dekhna chalo chalo wahan chalte hain to be went there as you know he could not sit because of an injury to his back and he was a real presence I mean, his life testified to a greatness of how he had helped leprosy patients it was a it was a real aura so uh, either he has to stand or he has to lie down and talk so there was a beautiful tree and he was lying under that and talking to the children and to us so very moving talk and after that one boy called alok sikka was a big fighter but he could not walk he could not talk he always crawled on his fours it took him one minute to complete the question he said baba
He said, okay, I'll tell you a story. He said that Gandhiji had so and so a very big devotee, follower of his. And the follower was with Gandhiji at Sabarabhati Ashram. And suddenly, now it was uh, 1 o'clock, Gandhiji's lunch time or 12.30, whenever he used to have lunch, so people got up and went to his room. And there, his daughter was there, she was a mentally handicapped girl. And she was in a very distressing condition when he saw her. I will not describe the condition. Very distressing. He became furious. And he picked up the girl and he ran back to Gandhiji's room. And by that time, Gandhiji had gone into meditation. And he took the girl and threw it at her. Gandhiji was startled. He said, why did your God do this to her? So Gandhiji was... After a few seconds he said, so and so, he did it to melt your heart into kindness. So we were all very moved by this story. So Alok said, again it took him two minutes to say this. If your God wanted to melt my parents' heart into kindness, why did he do this to me? And Baba Ante got up and he told me, I will not come back to the school till I have found an answer to Alok's question. And whenever after that I met him, from a distance he would say, Arun, wait, I have still not found it. I have still not found the answer to it. But you see, we keep saying he is doing this to build our character. We say, no, 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 he imposes a burden, no doubt. But it is never a burden that exceeds the capacity, your capacity to bear it. This is the place in the Quran. Just because I do not commit suicide, you say that the burden that has been put on me is something that I can bear. Very well. Just because the six billion Jews did not commit suicide and went to extermination camps and died and were killed, we say uh -huh, the burden that was, not put, that was put on them was not beyond their capacity to bear. This is a simple fact. But we don't see that and we keep repeating the phrase. So that is the, you know, you can go through each one of these explanations in this way. Now, just see, a school, a special, children are special. They were 30 years ago, 25 years ago, no school for special children. Now, because of these mothers, there are schools in different parts of the country. Now, in setting up this school, are the mothers carrying out God's will or are they defying God's will? He wants to put the child into that condition and you are trying to alleviate his condition. If the brain surgeon succeeds, has he succeeded because of God's benediction or in spite of God? So should we, uh, should we uh, praise God for the work of these sterling women or should we reserve our admiration for those mothers? In the same way, Satan, the whole book of Job is what? Satan taunts him, Are you don't know. God says there is no more devoted person to me on earth than Job. And God says, uh, Satan says, Are what do you mean? It's only because nothing evil has happened to him. Let me touch him and then see what he says. And then just it is a, it is a story which is greatly revered as an explanation. But if you just see, go through that thing. God doesn't do it. He says, hey, somebody else asked me to do it. Once it is Noah, one, Noah, once it is uh, Moses, once it is uh, uh, Satan. Someone made me do it. 
If there is a defeat, first there is a victory. And Allah says, yes, yes. See, I ensured the victory for you to strengthen your faith. A few days later, there is a big defeat. <laughs> he said, I did it. So as to test your faith. Will you deserve to be in defeat or not? And then a division of labor, that all good comes from him and all evil comes from because of me. It is, a, you will find the, uh, the things, uh, he saw, he claims in these books that I have, all right, don't bother man, you are uh, wasting your time, don't try to convert them or educate them. I have sown, planted the seed of unbelief in their hearts. Nothing that you do will change them. And then he punishes people for not believing in him. At points he says, I have deliberately put unbelievers in your path. So as to test how far you will go in exterminating them, that will alone prove to you, prove to me your devotion. Compassionate. Conventional thing in our thing, ne usko shaft mila. Curses. Krishna dies. Why? Gandhari is cursed. For killing her sons. So he dies forlorn under the tree. <coughs> Sri Ramakrishna Paramahans, one of the explanations was, he, he gives in that gospel according to Ramakrishna by Manmat Gupta. The cancer, he can't now swallow. And she, she the mother, Shata Devi, she says the same thing. That it is because of a curse of his elder brother. The elder brother was very unfair. And the doctor had said, no, she, he must not take anything. But he was taking water. So Ramakrishna Paramahans took the glass of water from him and took it away. And the brother said, I curse you. A day will come when you will not be able to swallow even water. <laughs> and immediately he repented. He said, oh, I am so sorry. But Ramakrishna said, but he was such a good man that his curse just had to take effect. But actually, the curse does not explain. It only pushes the question one step back. Do you have to then explain why the curse? So these sorts of explanations are there uh, all the time. A familiar explanation is vicarious penance. All the devotees of Sri Ramakrishna Paramahansa and of Raman Maharshi said that they are suffering because of our sins. And Ramakrishna himself says, that, no, 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 this so and so. Uh, uh, one person of the devotee, he always keeps bringing people to me, they touch me, you see. He thinks I am blessing them, but actually I have to take over their karma. That is why this has happened. The same thing the devotees of Raman Maharishi said. But it is not a plausible thing. Why should that happen? Just we keep saying Jesus suffered for our sins and for our salvation. Of course, we have not been saved in spite of his sacrifice. We remain as sinful. But the other difficulty is that these are just phrases that are repeated of vicarious penance. Because the same scriptures say, no one shall suffer for the sin of another. In our own case, uh, I will only mention two of these things and then go on to the next point and finish. You see, we, our thing is karma. Because we want to absolve God. So we say it is because of karma. The child has been born like this by the Kuttuk Yahuva karma. So what is the proof of that? So it is a circular argument. Had he not done something even in his, then you cannot, you see, because the good do not prosper always and the evil prosper in this life. So we have to explain it only by saying, then in Pichli life me kuch kiya ho. nobody knows about Pichli life and ugly life. 
This is the one Swiss account, unknown Swiss account. <laughs> and somebody should file a PIL asking the Supreme Court to be, if you SIT, then you can find this account. This account can find this account. But it's an explanation we keep... Um, uh, there are two points about this and you will see how all of the explanation is. There are many worthwhile points in the theory of karma. For instance, a karma taken not only as a deed but a thought leaves a change on the mind. It, it uh, forms, you know, uh, strengthens some interconnections, weakens other interconnections, neurons get fired in a particular way. Thereby I am predisposed to do certain things in my next round. Not next life but tomorrow. And doing that good or bad uh, things that cumulatively lead lands me into a particular problem. That's a good point. Similarly, collective karma. We see it today, the karma of all of us and climate change, the karma of uh, all of us in insanitary living and epidemics. So there are good points. But on the main point of an individual's suffering, the theory of karma only fails them transfers all the blame onto the poor victim. He is not going to be You just see how hollow this thing is. A tsunami comes, three lakh are killed. We say that their karma is ripened. I mean, just how logical that three lakh persons in different parts of the world should simultaneously and at that moment be on the beach or near the beach where the tsunami will strike. It does not stand to reason. But we keep repeating uh, it in this way. Here, you must distinguish between purpose and effect. You see, what is attributed here is purpose to suffering. That Ramakrishna says, there is a purpose in me to, to take and to, my mind is now gravitating towards the Nirgur. So the purpose is to take me from the Sagun of Kali to the Nirgur. In uh, Raman Maharshi's case, all those around him say, and he himself in an oblique statement says, but you see, that this is helping you see that I am not this body. They say, but please don't leave us, Bhagwan. He says, but where will I go? You are lamenting that I will go somewhere because you are still identifying me with the body. So his protracted and painful illness is said to have the purpose of educating his followers that he is not the body. But here we must distinguish between purpose, which is something we read into it, and actually speaking, the effect, it may have that effect. I have given the example of my mother passing away. My mother was a saint, you know, for us a saintly person. She was a sort of synapse of, of a very large, uh, uh, you know, cousins, aunts, uncles, everybody would gravitate to her. And she was truly, her name was Devanti and she was the dispenser of kindness. But in the end she had several, uh, uh, ischemia, Transient ischemia, transient strokes. She would lose her eyesight slowly to some part would come back. She lost her speech. Many times my father rehabilitated her by reciting. He would begin a couplet which they had been married together for 65 years, so he would begin a life. And insist that she repeat it. And I used to get so angry. Why are you doing this? Because each time you start this, it is only reminding her that she cannot speak. He said, you don't understand me. And over six months, he got her speech back. First, she would only start with her eyes. Then she started mumbling. Then she would utter a word. Then she started completing the sentence. Then she would complete the whole word. 
But in the end, I was I had gone to her room, and a maid was bringing her to the to the bed, and she just collapsed. I just held her because of our child. There are many wheelchairs in the house, so put her in the wheelchair, drove her to a hospital. <coughs> they said there has been a big bleed. Take her to a hospital. Five days, so I slept there. My brother, sister, aunt, uncle, everybody would keep coming and she was lying in this icy room with those tubes stuck into the terrible side. Then one, about to, uh, midnight, one night, the doctor said that, you see, now the pain has been so extensive that she cannot now recover functions and awareness. Now we can keep her going like this. So what do you say? So we had already deliberated on this and my father actually had written a book on voluntary exit. And he has given him the book. I hide the book because my uncle has given the recipe that you can take this and exit. So I rang up my brother and sister. This is what the doctor is saying. So we said, no, don't keep her alive. Right? So at, they said, all right, at 4 o'clock, we will withdraw these things. And it will take two hours for all her functions to see. So naturally, my brother and sister, they came. And those two hours are in my, everybody's minds in our family. My brother, my sister put the large bindi on her head. She used to have it. Always wear a large bindi, put the sindhu. She combed her hair. She was always stroking her hair. My brother was stroking her arms. I was stroking her feet. And this went on till 6 o'clock and all the lines became horizontal. She passed away like this. Now you can say, the effect of it could be that the three of us are now even more closely bonded to each other than we might otherwise have been. But can you say that this was the purpose for which he was put through it so that the three of us would be bonded together? But we think that the suffering that has been imposed is for that kind of a purpose by somebody. That is the great error, uh, a, 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 a falsification that we believe in. So I, I don't want to take more of your time, but I just mention one thing and then say the positive aspect, the last parts of the book are the positive parts of what lessons can be learned in all this. But I'll give you one instance and then just uh, finish this. See, God is not central to our tradition. In none of the four Mahavakya is God mentioned. But the soul is in each of the four. I am Brahma me, I am that. I means not the ego, but the soul. Tattva this is that. This what? The soul is as in Brahma. But are they aware? <laughs> and that is not, that is the concept of a completely unchanging entity that transits. It is not, uh, uh, what are the neurologists say, neuroscientists today saying about such an entity? They are able to explain not just the functions of thought, but of consciousness and awareness through merely the structure and processes and instincts built into the brain, hardwired. Uh, hardware and software. Now that has a very big beginning thing uh, bearing on our tradition. But we are not open to that knowledge. We are not keeping up with that knowledge. For us, it is the mystic's experience which best testifies to this. Raman Maharishi says, yes, it's a soul. I have seen it. Ramakrishna Paramahansa is repeatedly going into that state. Raman Maharishi lives in that state. So we say, they will see, that is true. But the question now is, it is well documented about the plasticity of the brain, not just the thoughts, not just the interconnections between neurons, but the
the very structure of the brain can be changed in just a few weeks. The amount of real estate which is devoted to a particular function changes by, uh, I mean, within a few weeks, not just prolonged. And in the case of the mystics, all these experiences were preceded by long years of uh, austerities and of extreme longing. Ramakrishna says, the devotee comes and says, I want that experience. I, how do I attain it? The first you must have longing. He said, how much? What longing? He said, you know, once a disciple went to a guru, asked the same question. The guru took him to a lake, took his head and put it in the water and held it there. And the man was almost dead. And then he pulled him up. He said, what was, what was your experience? He said, I just was dying for breathing, for a breath of air. He says, when you die for God like that, then you come. Now, that longing is actually changing the real estate in my brain. Those austerities are changing. The interconnections, the whole structure, because of the plasticity of the brain, so the question arises that, that the experience of the mystic was genuine is true. No doubt. You cannot doubt the word of Ramakrishna and Ramaparishi. But the question is whether because of the preceding austerities and this intense longing and the considered milieu, they had not learned unconsciously to trigger those things in the brain and their body which led to this effulgent experience. So did the experience testify to a reality out there? Or was it just an experience which was internal to them? So these questions are examined in the book. And the, my own conclusions are twofold. First, that you know, we should not spend, there are no, no explanations. And we should really not spend much time in looking for those explanations because these great persons who look for the explanations have come up with such pedestrian things which cannot be, which cannot stand examination. So the attitude of the Buddha is, is the most um, appealing in a sense. He said, Baba, whether there is a God or not, whether space is finite or infinite, whether time has a beginning and an end or not, there is suffering, it has to be dealt with, here is a way. And the main point about the way was, he said, I cannot do anything about the primary cause of suffering. Your child has a brain injury, I can't do anything about it. Maybe the doctor can. You should go to the doctor. But what is happening is that on that primary cause, you have built a seven-story structure. Why did this happen? Why did this happen to my child? Why did this happen to this innocent child? What will happen when I age and die? He said, I can help you dismantle that structure. And therefore, the focus on the mind was central to our tradition, both in the Buddha, it is central, for instance, in the Patanjali's Yoga Sutras. Uh, as you know, the, the very definition of yoga by Patanjali, yoga chitta vritti nirod. Yoga means to calm the unintended perturbations in the mind. And the whole sutra, all the sutras are directed towards that. That was the central point of our tradition. We have forgotten that and did all the other things except that. And the second point is that service is one of the disciplines, uh, is one of the disciplining forces that can help us deal with our life. For instance, the child's needs, you, see, you go to any monastery or vihar, any Christian monastery, Benedictine time monastery, Zen monastery to a good vihar, you will be put through various routines to serve.
subordinate your desires to that particular routine. Get up at 2 o'clock, clean the toilets, do this, go to bed. This is to overcome the ego, it is to, it is to subordinate other desires that aims we may have to this particular uh, task, to this routine. But a handicapped child enforces that subordination just by being there. So the point is, one of the lessons that the book narrates is, yes, there is no purpose, but we can endow even extreme suffering with a purpose. And in that, the great saints are our examples. When Raman Maharishi dies with such calm, in such intense pain, that he cannot now be here darshan, he cannot sit, uh, lie in the hall, he is moved into a room and there is a window there. So he lies there so the people passing by can pass. Then the pain becomes so excruciating that the window is closed. He says, no, no, open the window. So that they can have the darshan to be. When that, so that calm becomes the great example. He's putting, endowing even that extreme pain with some purpose and suffering. Uh, and service, service, especially the Dalai Lama has a wonderful sentence, if you want to be truly selfish, help somebody. I have put a footnote to that. If you want to be truly selfish, help someone who cannot do anything for you in return. Because if he can do something for us in return, we will always be looking But when a child can do nothing for us and yet we serve him, he transforms us. That is how those who we help, help us. That's the book. Thank you so very much. Was absolutely brilliant, not something we have never discussed before. By the way, sir, uh, he knew you were going to question him, but he could not do anything about it. He could not do anything about it. Uh, Prince, uh, it's all yours. Yes, Pat, where are you? Come. Okay, quick. I have an innocent question here. Yeah, I have a very innocent question. Could I just say one thing? Sir, uh, can you please take these books because they'll get wet? Yeah. Sir. I have a very innocent question. You, you ask me how you can ask me. Uh, you, you explain, I'll, I'll repeat it. I, I wanted to ask whether Raja got free will from he, the, the, the part of he, and then he distributed, now he is under tremendous pressure of, you know, Ferguson and testing about, you know, God and he will come out clean, something like that. Actually, uh, I'll give you another story like Baba Amte, as to how the title of this book, or Raja, we should leave to him. You know, the title of this book is, uh, Does it He Know a Mother's Heart? And that comes from a meeting uh, 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 with Mr. J. Krishnamurti. See, Krishnamurti ji had come to Delhi and was staying there, and Mr. Amnath Goenka used to know, he used to boast, he said, Ki, Lok Manya Tilak ke time se, or Shri Arvind ke time se, aaj tak koi leader nahi hua, or koi godman nahi hua, jisko mein nahi janta tha, jisko mein first term, first name term par nahi janta.